Coop, welcome, man. Thanks for being on. How you doing? Hey, man. Doing well. Thank you for having me. Of course, bro. Of course. All right. Let's get started. For those who don't know you, uh, let's give a quick brief about yourself, what you did before crypto and kind of where you are now. Yeah. So I've been a fan of the music industry for a long time. Prior to crypto, I was super deep into journalism, DJing, touring, all the likes, graduated with a music business degree, and then fell on the crypto rabbit hole as a way to sort of make a name for myself in a new industry. So the past five years, I like to say I've been building the creator economy, doing a lot of work on the community front, uh, helping creators learn how to leverage technology to their advantage. Awesome. I think a big misconception that people get when they enter crypto is that they have to be technical and be a developer and know how to build smart contracts. Uh, obviously, people like you and I were more community focused or more front end. What do you see being like your day to day role in crypto? Communications at large. I mean, I think that marketing and strategy are really important, you know, relationship building, business development, all of those kind of fall under that umbrella, but basically helping to connect the dots and make sure that people are working on the right thing. So, you know, I'm definitely not technical in nature, but I've gotten far enough to the point that I can speak the language well enough to make sure that I'm helping to point people in the right direction and get shit done. Yeah. Who who got you into crypto? Like, how did you hear about Bitcoin, Ethereum? I know you're a big ETH head for, for obvious reasons. Like, how did you fall down that rabbit hole? What's that story? So my music business teacher was teaching a class on the future of music. And in that uh, course, he actually mentioned smart contracts as a way to expedite royalty payments. You know, at that time, it made perfect sense to me. You know, I should be able to send half of a cent transaction to someone directly with no middleman, and it shouldn't take six months. And so after hearing that, I just kind of dug a little deeper into what he was talking about. I stumbled across a bunch of white papers. And then from there, you know, the rabbit hole kind of opened up and I quickly found myself reading more about it every single day. And it was ETH that you bought first? What was the first one you bought? Uh, first things I bought were Bitcoin and a bunch of random shit on Bittrex, like terrible tokens. <laughs> Most of them went to zero. You know, there's definitely a rite of passage in crypto where when you're first getting involved, it's difficult to distinguish between what is valuable and what's not valuable. It actually wasn't until about a year or two into my crypto career that I started to really understand, you know, the power that Ethereum had with smart contracts and kind of all the capabilities on top of it that further led me to kind of building a career on top of that ecosystem that I have today. Got you. And the reason uh, I kind of have you here, obviously, you, you published a fire article kind of covering the, the DAO landscape. They got a ton of traction online, a lot of eyeballs. Uh, first off, like how much time did you put into that? Because that's that's pretty comprehensive. Yeah, I'd say about 10 to 20 hours. You know, when I go deep on a subject, I really like to look across the whole space, try and aggregate as many projects as possible, put out a tweet a few days before I published with kind of a uh, VIP or an MVP version of it that kind of had a map. And I said, hey, if you want to be on this map, now's your chance. Tried to give everyone the time to get on it so they couldn't pitch at me after. But, you know, all things considered, I've been working actively in the DAO space for about two to three years at this point, as early as some grants DAOs back in 2018. But the past three to five months, we'll call it, has when I've been seeing a lot more traction around this sector in particular. And so I really wanted to aggregate a lot of my learnings and help people understand what I was seeing in the space. Yeah. It, and I only ask that because you're, you, you do a lot of things and everyone's title for you is like Cooper comma, a lot of things, right? Mm -hmm. So you were managing RAC social token. Uh, you're working at Audius. You're a part of many organizations and different groups. I feel like the more, the more discord channels you pop in, the more you see your name involved, right? Whether it be balancer as well. Um, one, how do you find the time to manage everything when there's a lot of FOMO in crypto and everybody wants to get their hands on a lot of things and be exposed to a lot of things? How do you manage your time between Audius, between REC, between these style projects, uh, living life and just, doing, just, just being a human? Yeah. I mean, I like to say I work on whatever excites me. I've gotten to a point in my life where my work and my, you know, outer life balance are basically the same where like I'm doing social stuff and it happens to be work related too. So time wise, you know, I think I'm just keeping my finger on the pulse, trying to make sure I'm aware of what's going on. And more recently, when I see people with uh, an affinity for the space that are really excited to use the technology, I want to try and carve out time to help them. Because I think those are the use cases where you learn the most about what's going wrong and where we need to improve as an industry moving forward. Yeah. I think also from the point of view that many times you could be an active contributor and a passive contributor. Uh, how do you kind of not prioritize because that kind of falls back to, to that answer, but being a part of so many different organizations, like when you are joining one and you becoming more of an active contributor, what do you find yourself doing? And then how does that kind of spread across the multiple groups you get involved with? Yeah, it comes in waves. I mean, I like to say that I work on a lot of different sprints at one time. And so for any given project, they're typically cycles where they're rolling out a big update, you know, they're releasing a product, they're looking to do a big marketing push. And so 
I try and stay aware of everything that's happening. And when I see something I can really double down on, I really try and hop in and create as much value as possible. You know, uh, these days we see a lot of these DAOs forming boards or councils. I try and sit on as many of those as possible. And, you know, beyond being a, a member of a DAO, I really like to try and add value where I can as it makes sense. And just being there, you know, putting in a couple hours a week, it's really not as much time as you'd think. It's just really the intent and the commitment to always stay active and engaged with what's going on there. Yeah. Do you ever find yourself spreading too thin, you know, because you want to get involved with too many things? Do you, do you ever come across that? Because I think it's like a point of fatigue that many people come across in crypto because they're trying to get involved uh, with different projects. Do you ever experience that? I haven't found it to be the case yet. I mean, luckily, I have a lot of people around me who are fantastic coworkers of mine. You know, I can really trust them with the stuff that I'm working on. And if it gets to a point where I feel like I'm getting too overwhelmed, I'll make sure to try and delegate that to someone I really trust. So the strength of my network has helped me kind of do all the things that I do. And I really value those relationships to help me get across the finish line for all the stuff that I work on. Yeah, that's that's fair. It makes a lot of sense. So the first DAO you joined was a Grants DAO back in 2018. Which one was that? It was called Metacartel. So this was basically my first real friend group in the space. You know, up until that point, I was traveling the world, going to crypto conferences, basically by myself in the middle of, you know, Thailand, going to some random blockchain conference. And then I started hearing about these things called uh, Ethereum developer conferences, ETH global events, DevCon, you know, these more premier Ethereum events. And as I got there, I found this group of people really focused on mainstream adoption. They were saying, hey, we have a group of us that love the idea of crypto. We think that we're too technical now and we want to get beyond that to help expedite mainstream adoption. To me, that really stuck out. And so I just kind of got involved, met a bunch of people on the DAO. You know, some of the early members were really welcoming to me, people like James Wall and Alex Mazmez and Peter Peter Pan, and really just took me in under their wing and kind of got me involved in the group. And, you know, the rest is history from there. But that was the DAO that really set it off for me and really helped guide my career in the right direction. Yeah, you know, you that, that point in time, 2018, I remember that really specifically because late 17, early 18 is when I started getting involved. And at the time, you you saw a lot of these DeFi projects that are well and alive right now being built during that dead period, mm -hmm. during that crypto winter, right? And a lot of people were just really looking for devs to help build out these solutions. And it was hard to find community roles to, to kind of bootstrap your, your career for non-technical people. Uh, but I guess as time persists, right, people need community members, people need front-facing people, and largely part of what DAOs are, right? It, it's a lot of these front-facing individuals that either play community roles, right, uh, management roles, uh, mod roles. Talk to me more about that. Like, what are you, what are you seeing, like, the types of roles and the people that are either joining DAOs, forming DAOs? What does that look like to you? Yeah, I use the term operator broadly, you know, on the role of coordination, I think there's so much to be done in a DAO on any given day that having these lead individuals who are running point on organizing community calls, you know, they're taking notes at, you know, internal calls, they're helping to organize different team leads, you know, these people that are kind of just playing point across the community, I'm starting to see more and more some of the first hires every DAO makes is basically uh, a community manager on steroids, where it's not just about being in a chat and like moderating it, it's about actually running the show behind the scenes you know, making sure all the ducks are in a row, making sure that all the game plans in order. And then most importantly, keeping everyone abreast to it. You know, there's so many people across so many sectors in every DAO that a lot of times people don't know what everyone else is working on. And so having one person that kind of acts as the touch point to really organize everything and keep everyone in check, I think is probably one of the most valuable roles that the DAO has to offer today. Yeah. And a lot of these DAOs get started, uh, from a group chat and I know you wrote in your mm -hmm. article one ETH, you know, at least one ETH, probably even maybe even less sometimes a uh, telegram group chat and a bold idea to kind of pursue. And when people are thinking DAOs, sometimes people get confused by buzzwords, right? And especially the people are going to be listening to this, right? These creators, these individuals that either want to make their audience more crypto native form these DAOs. It kind of gets, I guess, uh, confusing because, from a creator's point of view, let's talk about from a musician's point of view, these are like modern day fan clubs, right? And when you're building these modern day fan clubs right now, they're, they're managed by centralized entities. So when people are thinking about forming these decentralized autonomous organizations, how can they kind of dictate whether they should pursue more of the centralized path and do what's what's known through an LLC model and have a management team that manage fan clubs and manages social profiles, et cetera, et cetera versus decentralizing it and making people a part of it? Like how, how should people kind of dictate whether that's right for them? I think it's a gradual path forward. You know, I think that at the start, just getting people to understand the fact that you have a token associated with your project is a really scary thing. And so spending the first three months, let's call it, getting people familiar with that topic, saying, hey, if you hold these tokens, you're going to get a better relationship with me. 
and deeper access into that community. That's kind of like V1 of it. And then based on how receptive your audience is to that, I think over time you introduce things like voting, you know, like the most important pieces of a DAO that are kind of picked away and just introduced very gradually. And as you kind of keep running that flywheel and your most active members understand that this token is an integral part of your ecosystem, then you can start doing deeper things like treasury management, you know, off-chain voting, like, you know, token swaps and whatnot. But for the first, let's call it three to six months of any creator tokens lifecycle, I don't think it makes sense to try and hit someone over the head and say you're now part of this magic DAO working group. You know, you slowly weed them in and uh, give them incentives to keep contributing. And then before you know it, you'll just have a DAO right in front of you. Yeah, and I think you're seeing that right now between Rally Roll and all these random ERC, independent ERC-20 tokens that are pegged to either people's name, brand, or reputation, right? You're seeing a lot of the creators experiment with this route of going public, and they're trying to create utility, trying to create value to Rally and a network effect behind it. And I think we're starting to see at a point where, okay, you've taken yourself public, quote unquote, you have your social token, you have anywhere between 70 to 500 people holding it, right? You have the Discord channel. What is that process now to make that transition into a DAO? And I only bring that up because the most common example or the most successful example to date is either Friends with Benefits or Whale that come to mind, right? Mm -hmm. And Whale didn't start through a DAO format. They started more centralized and now they've transitioned to a DAO. So like you have your token, you have people holding it. How do you transition into this DAO? It's a great question. I mean, speaking off the cuff on it, I think most importantly is finding contributors that you can trust to run the thing. So going beyond giving people rewards for liking social posts, actually empowering them to have true ownership over the project. So tasking them with setting up community calls on a regular basis, tasking them with doing competitions to engage your token holders more, you know, things like that and really building out that core team of let's call it five to 10 people that you really trust to be the, the inner circle of the DAO. That seems like V1 to me. And then I think V2 is once you have that inner circle trusted, actually putting a substantial amount of money into a pot for people to be able to decide what to do with. You know, um, I think for most creator tokens, giving away your own tokens is fantastic. It's the easiest thing on the table. I challenge everyone that's starting a DAO to think about how can you hold assets outside of your own native token? And when you start going through that process of either swapping your token for ETH or a stable coin or something like that, and then choosing how to distribute that to your community in the form of paid roles, you know, things start to get really interesting. And that's where I think the stuff like governance becomes more important to actually make it a reality. So when you're talking about these assets that people are holding outside of the communities, what else can you kind of give an example to? So outside of governance, so just so just so people understand. Yeah, so um, with Friends with Benefits, we now have four different teams. Each of those teams is a team lead. So we have editorial, product, membership, and treasury. Each one of those teams has a team lead that's receiving USDC on a monthly basis and some tokens on top of that. You know, there's a pool of incentives for anyone that wants to join those teams, but you kind of have these organizations that are uh, more formalized in sort of their structure. And then outside of that, we have kind of ad hoc monthly budgets that we post on Snapshot for things like events. So in Miami, we threw an IRL event. Um, we booked some DJs. We rented out a venue, uh, doing some stuff at ECC coming up in a couple of weeks. And so there are definitely larger decisions to be made with like dollars, basically. And when those come into the picture, I think it's important to have you know, governance in place to be able to keep the community informed on what you want to spend it on. Yeah. One thing that I find very interesting about Friends with Benefits is that you guys did a capital raise well after you guys were established, you proved your concept and the vision that you're trying to execute. Um, and now, now the DAO is very fluid, right? It's very rich, capital rich. And I feel like at some point now you guys have your, 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 uh, your treasury and your grants program, right? From what I'm understanding. And that's even probably being applied to build products internally that help kind of orchestrate the DAO more efficiently. Like the best thing that comes to mind is when I was in Miami, I attended the, the Friends with Benefit, happily a member. So everyone go check it out. Um, but you know, like there's there's a point where, okay, the club is full, but also how do you authenticate that people are holders and how can you do that with the people in the front that are permitting people in and out so that you mm -hmm. or Trevor or more of these core contributors don't have to be like, okay, you're in, you're in, you're in, you're in kind of thing, right? So yeah, these are like, the, the, yeah. <laughs> These are like, these are projects and products obviously that will develop with time and all these things are social experiments. But now that these creators, they're, they're getting capital, right? They're, they're getting their fans to pump and, and switch from USDC to their native token, creating these liquidity pools, et cetera. At what point, I guess, once you have your DAO, how do you now kind of manage and, and portion a segment for your treasury, portion a segment for your, for your grants, et cetera, et cetera. Like how do you segmentate that also for, for team leads? Like, how does that mm -hmm. work exactly? 
Uh, there's no right answer here. I mean, I'll go back to like trusting your core contributors. I think every team has its own unique skill sets and doing everything you can to empower them. You know, the one thing I love about DAOs is people pretty much define their own salaries. You know, if someone wants to work for the DAO full time, chances are they'll present a proposal saying, hey, I want this amount of money to do this amount of work. And in that situation, you know, whatever the outcome of that is will happen naturally. You know, I think that we're all as an industry trying to figure out standards around that. And so you're, st you're seeing tools to help with this, you know, in the rally ecosystem, I'm a big fan of these guys uh, working on Bonfire. It's basically a tool to create, you know, easier ways to distribute tokens and do fun things with your tokens. On the Ethereum side of things, we have tools like Coordinate to distribute tokens to active contributors. And so right now, you know, I think it's more about at earmark a budget, you know, of whatever amount you want to do and then figure out how to spend that relative to who wants to work on it. So if someone wants to come to the table and run a podcast for you, if they want to run a newsletter for you, you know, give them some coins, see what they do. It's not like you're locked into having to do these things for years on end. The approach we take at Friends with Benefits is throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks. And now over time, as we've run a lot of these experiments, we can start to see you know, really clearly defined working groups come out of that. So like I said, a product team to further build things like that RSVP for IRL events. We're working very hard on that now because we saw a clear problem from our first event that we threw, but we never would have known that was going to happen if we didn't throw the event in the first place. So, you know, just trying to figure out how to really get people activated and mobilized around anything regarding the community, breaking stuff with it, and then putting smart people on the task to solve it. I think it's a pretty smart way to just kind of go about it and uh, figure out what works over time. But the challenge is, how do you do this in a decentralized manner? Because n naturally with DAOs, you're not going to have your CEO, your managers, your executives. You can call them team leads, but are people still taking order from people in a decentralized fashion? Like, I feel like that's a misconception that people come across. Like, how does a group function without a leader, right? How yeah. does that work? How do you guys think about that? That's a great question. I think that, um, you know, orders kind of naturally form in and of themselves. I think what's important is that you're not giving someone like full power to make every decision. And everyone that is in power is aware of the fact that they are part of a wider group. So at FWB, our first hire was Alex Zhang. He's absolutely killing it for us. I would say that he's been making a lot of the bigger decisions on stuff like events and sort of governance and, um, you know, moving the ball forward on team lead side of things. And while we all have a say in that, you know, he's been really mindful of looping people in and kind of making sure that people feel engaged and empowered. And in that situation, I think it's OK to have a couple of people that have a lot of the shots being called so long as they're recognizing that they are not a dictator and they need to take into consideration, you know, the thoughts of others when making these decisions. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Have you seen any, whether it be with FWB or other DAOs that you've participated, have you seen examples where kind of the founders come into place, right? They set the vision, they set the mission, they bring in key stakeholders to kind of manage and help out on executing different stuff. And then because it's a DAO, right? And naturally is decentralized, other shareholders that hold a lot of FWB or whatever DAO token it is, they kind of maybe come more into power than what was intended and start shifting the direction of what that DAO was intentionally intended to do and execute on. Have you seen that? I know the one example that comes to mind more recently is Kane Warwick with synthetics, right? Mm -hmm. But have you kind of seen these more with these social communities that are forming or um, investment communities that are, that are being formed? Not so much with the social communities. I mean, the first example that comes to mind for me here is Yearn, uh, the Wi-Fi ecosystem, where basically it's this highly sophisticated DeFi protocol. Um, Andre Cronier, who started it, is this famous DeFi uh, developer, but over time he sort of phased himself out in favor of this more DAO-like structure, you know. And I don't think that's been for the better or worse. I think the project's been operating extremely well. But what it does show is you don't need the core founder to be making every decision for something to move forward. It just requires people to be highly incentivized and aligned to build cool shit. Yeah, no, that that makes a lot of sense. I want to bring up um, your DAO landscape article and kind of run through that for a minute, and specifically bring out. Um, this is the old one. Let's let's really quickly find this new one. Uh, it's on via mirror on your profile, right? Yeah. So yeah, it's pretty funny. Um, yeah. The the old image I tweeted out. You know, you asked me earlier how much time did I spend on this. You know, my first pass through, I knew that people were going to roast me because I didn't right. have their thing in the image, and so I basically put that first tweet out to say, "Hey, this is V one of this map. I'm going to publish it in 48 hours. If you want your." project to be named here, this is your shot to do it. And so obviously that got some great engagement. I think 300 plus projects commented on it. So I had to kind of siphon it down a bit. But what it showed is that, you know, taking time to get feedback from the community before publishing actually ended up being net positive for this post. And as you'll see in this new map that you pull up in a second here, 
Um, it's really just mind boggling, like how many DAOs there are in the ecosystem now. And there's so many that it's hard to keep track. You know, uh, Legion commented on my post when I asked for a peer review saying, at some point, it's going to be impossible to track all these because DAOs are basically just LLCs. And it's right. not like you have a map for all the LLCs in the world because there are just too many to count. But, you know, luckily, we're at a stage where it's early enough now that we can sort of paint a, a full overview picture of that and recognize that there are still a lot of opportunities out there for people who want to get involved and create value in the space. Yeah, and actually, let's let's pull it up because I like the link that I saved was actually a different link. So let's do this really quick. Uh, let me pull it up. So we'll go over here, share screen. Um, boom. Okay, Dow landscape. Okay, so you broke it down very strategically and very concise and clean, which I love about your writing. Every time I come across one of your pieces, specifically with this one, it's like four to five lines per Dow explaining what it is, and it's getting straight to the point. Okay. So just to bring up the graphic, I know it kind of like fades out, but the DAO operating system, protocol DAOs, investment DAOs, grant DAOs, service DAOs, social DAOs, uh, collector DAOs, and whatever is below the fold uh, right here, and media DAOs, right? And all these DAOs serve their own intention, try to solve their own problems. There probably is a lot of overlap. Uh, probably, who knows? Uh, it's hard to keep up with everything, but I'm just seeing with how you categorize them, okay? I want to go one by one really quick and give me Give me a quick definition uh, from DAO operating systems, protocol DAOs, investment DAOs, so on and so forth. And we'll kind of dive into all of them individually. Yeah. So I'll just read off the map here and maybe you can scroll down throughout. You know, basically when I was making this article, I wanted to try and differentiate what different DAOs operated under in like a very large bucket. So starting at the top there, DAO operating systems, this is a way for you to make a DAO. You know, any of the projects in there help you either form a DAO, start a token, or basically create an operating system. Uh, protocol DAOs are probably the most common ones that you see. That is a DAO for an underlying DeFi protocol or project that basically governs the way the whole system operates. So you'll see a lot of huge names on there. You know, I use the term DAO here because most of these projects have a treasury of, let's say, a billion dollars that's being allocated across the ecosystem in some way, shape or form. And token holders have the ability to vote on how that capital is allocated, which makes them really exciting. Investment DAOs are ones that I've been a part of in the past year. This is basically people coming together, pulling, let's say, uh, a thousand ETH and then deciding how to invest in early stage projects, which has been really fun to kind of parlay token based investments. Grant style, we talked about this earlier. Um, some of the first ones I got involved with, basically we all have capital. We want to see it put to work in a productive way for people that need it. And so people make applications to receive funding and these grant styles allocate them capital to build cool shit in their ecosystem. Um, service styles, you know, I've spent a lot of time working through service styles in crypto. This is basically a way for you to provide a valuable service through a decentralized manner. I'll call out that one fire eyes in there that I do a lot of work through for a token and governance design where mm -hmm. we'll work with teams on an engagement to launch a token, to launch a protocol upgrade and get paid through an on-chain wallet and ether tokens to kind of do what be, would be considered consulting in a traditional sense, but in a much more involved and hands-on manner. Uh, going over to social DAOs there. I'm going to cut you off and we keep going. We're going to bang them all out. Uh, social DAOs, you know, FWB Seed Club, the thing I really love about social DAOs, it's more about the human nature than it is the financial nature. For a lot of those protocol DAOs that you see, the KPI is generally protocol fees. So how much is this protocol generating? What's the revenue and what's the profit? You know, while a lot of social DAOs still have that under the hood, it's more about what does it mean to be a member of this community? You know, what are the qualities and aspirations that I have by being a part of this DAO? And how do I come together to make uh, friends online and then hopefully in the future IRL relationships? Collector DAOs, mainly around NFTs. So Pleaser DAO is one that I've been doing a lot of work through. Basically, groups of individuals coming together to collect high value NFTs and then commission artists and empower and democratize those pieces over time. And the last one is media DAOs. So basically, instead of there being a closed entity that's doing reporting and story writing and whatnot, uh, we're now seeing this new chapter where anyone can come and contribute to a media outlet, get paid in tokens for that work and be a lot more open sourced about the way in which they source stories and the way in they share that to the world. Boom. There we go. That was the most comprehensive freaking breakdown ever. All right. So how many, how many projects are on there? I couldn't count. Do you know? At least a hundred. Okay. Over a hundred projects. And there's a saying in the startup world where when you make an investment in a startup, nine are going to fail. One is going to succeed. Mm -hmm. How many of these DAOs do you think are going to be here a year, two years from now? Uh, generously 50% maybe, you know, I think that we're in a very early experimentation phase where the idea of starting and joining a DAO is more exciting than actually executing upon it. You know, when you look at those protocol DAOs, I'd say that 
basically everyone that I listed in that protocol DAO bucket is going to make it. I think it's some of the more fringe ones that is unclear whether or not they have long-term sustainability. But what I will say is the fact that they're becoming so rampant and how fast they're being spun up, inevitably that at least a few of them are going to stand out and become like these really monolithic for the DAO space. I think that right now it's just a little bit too early to tell which those are and whether or not we actually have the cojones for all of us to make it through a bear market when the money is not flowing as much as it is right now. Yeah. One of the more, I guess, exciting ones that come to my mind, and I'll, and I'll bring it up again, are these investment DAOs, right? And some of them are structured more uh, decentralized. Others have more of a centralized entity supporting them and decisions are made more decentralized, right? How does that actually work from a, from a legal standpoint? If you're crowdfunding capital right now and either you're investing in illegal securities or you're investing in, um, I don't know, whatever it may be. Like, how is that structure kind of like put together from, from a legal point of view? Do you have insight on that? Yeah. So I'll call out the Lao here because I think they've done the best job of this. Um, the Lao is a LLC registered company here in the U S they're limited to accredited investors only. And there's a maximum of 99 members that can participate in that vehicle. And so everything that's being done there is done as an accredited investor. And that makes it so that these investments are compliant under SEC regulations. You know, on the other end of the spectrum, we have things like DuckDAO, which I'll call out, which is basically like send funds to an address and pool capital together. It works conceptually the same way that the Lao does, but I think there's a lot less formal process in place around KYC, you know, like AML, these typical investor procedures that we see for more formal investments. And as a result, a lot of the projects get spawned out of those are these kind of random coins that come onto the market, you know, they're definitely far more ad hoc, have a lot shorter life cycles. And so if I had to break it down, I would say that the more uh, legally compliant a DAO is, typically the longer time horizon those investments are, and typically the more sophisticated those investors are that are members of those DAOs. Yeah. And in terms of these, these grant DAOs, I feel like there's also a lot of overlap between the grant DAOs and the protocol DAOs. And maybe I'm getting it confused because a lot of these pro protocol DAOs have grant departments, right? That departments, DAOs, like sections that kind of make decisions on what to spend the capital on and their DAOs within, within themselves, right? They may be organized more, more centralized per se, but they govern the, the funds just like any other DAO would. The, the one that comes mm -hmm. to mind is Ave right now, right? Ave is going through that process. And if you're trying to get sponsorship for events or you're trying to get uh, any form of capital to build on top of the protocol or promote the protocol, you have to go through more of the cent uh, decentralized funnel uh, to get that money. So would you say there's like overlap between those two as well? Yeah, so every grants DAO spawns out of the protocol DAO. Well, the reason that I broke this off is for a lot of the ones that you see that are also in the protocol DAO section. So Compound, Uniswap, Aave, Audius, as four examples, those have all been spawned out of governance. So basically to pass a proposal in those protocol DAOs, you need a fuck ton of tokens, you need to make a really compelling argument, and it's really difficult to pass a proposal. And so what we've been seeing happening in the space is someone will make a proposal to start a grants DAO. This will basically take money out of the really heavy central, the really heavy DAO in the center and allocate it to a more nimble working group that becomes a grants DAO. And so in order to apply for a grants DAO, you don't need to have a bunch of tokens. You can fill out a form, fill out a Google form, get a thousand tokens here and there for doing some more lightweight work. And it really helps to disintermediate that step between needing super heavy on-chain governance to get a really small amount of capital and instead empower, let's call it five people to oversee a small fund of money and make sure that it gets sent out to the right people in a much more nimble ma manner. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Out of all these, what, what, what would you say is like your favorite uh, DAO uh, category that you've kind of enjoyed either participating in the most or you've seen kind of develop over the course of time? What's your favorite? Probably service DAOs. I mean, I'd say uh, social DAOs are a close second, but for me, my career has been basically predicated off working in a decentralized world. And so seeing the development around service DAOs and basically decentralized working groups coming together to deliver like really valuable products and service, I think has been extremely exciting. And just based on my recent conversations, we've only just begun to see like what DAO servicing looks like. And I think in this next year, we're going to see some really, really smart people come to the table on that front. Yeah, I think a lot of DAO service or server serves, whatever you want to call them, you're seeing them very like uh, human capital intensive. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think it's going to start transitioning into more of a software play uh, down the line? And if it's already kind of swinging there, what have you seen work? What have you seen not work? 
I'm not sure if I'd use the word software. I think the most important part about service DAO is they need to know how to make on-chain proposals. So this is something that's really complicated to average person. Basically, what you're doing is you're going to a protocol DAO that has a billion of dollars in capital and its treasury, and you're saying, hey, I think I can add value to this protocol. Here's a proposal for what I want to work on. And here's how I'm going to rally people around me to support this work and then execute it. And so, you know, right now, the way that service style work is either like hiring as a freelancer, like we're going to give you a thousand bucks to write this smart contract. Or what I personally like to do more is creating a really creative proposal and going to a community, talking out with them and then having a nice allocation of tokens to go and build really valuable upgrade to the platform that when executed upon actually makes your work and your compensation more valuable. Can you, can you give me an example of what that looks like? And I only bring that up because a lot of people are going to be approaching the space and they need reference as to what's quality versus not quality. So what does that look like from your point of view? And give us an example of how you've kind of done that and with who. Yeah, so I'll call out uh, Balancer as one great example. Me and my friends at FireEyes, we did a proposal around governance mining where we basically say, hey, we want people to be incentivized to contribute to the governance forum, to the Discord, uh, to vote on proposals. And we mapped out a pretty long proposal on how to get involved in what that could look like. It included allocations of tokens to go to each of those programs and included specifications on how to get those integrated into the communities. And I would say for anyone looking to learn about this, pop into basically any governance forum and or snapshot, look at any space for the DAOs mentioned on the, the map here, and you'll see an endless list of proposals where people are defining, we want to take X tokens and do Y with it. And in the middle, there is this nice formulated proposal with the framework on how to basically write that up and get it presented to a community in a very digestible and well-articulated manner. What's up, guys? Really quick, just want to shout out our amazing sponsors who are helping make Season 1 a reality. Season 1 welcomes Coinvise, where you can create a personal or community-owned social token on Ethereum. Coinvise also helps you create incentives through token rewards and bounties, NFT business models, and bot integrations for Discord. Go check them out at coinvise.co. Season 1 welcomes POAP, P-O-A-P, short for Proof of Attendance Protocol, which enables a novel way of creating one's life diary. Leveraging NFT tech, POAP facilitates an easy way to mint non-fungible tokens related to meaningful events. It's frequently used in crypto-native communities, and now it's starting to create NFT collectors in the mainstream too. They are hiring for roles like biz dev, key account management and operations. You can apply by visiting adamlevy.io forward slash POAP. That's P-O-A-P. All right, back to the episode. I think it's like critical. There needs to be some type of template that people go off to and reference, I think, in the future, because you're just going to be seeing as, as these communities get bigger and bigger, like the most random proposals and the most unstructured format uh, just yeah. taking up space on these on these uh, voting platforms, and it's probably already happening right now to an extent. Um, so I want to I want to pivot this for a minute into the creator's point of view, okay, mm -hmm. and into whether it be the dancer, the artist, the internet personality, um, uh, the the fashion designer, whatever it may be, right? When you're building these DAOs and you're trying to empower your fans, your audience to partake in this journey. There's already a hurdle with getting them more crypto native. And we said that the way to combat that is just give your tokens out for free. Okay. And once people are holding it, they're in their discord, they're being integrated into the process. You slowly transition them into the DAO format and find those key excited individuals. Those, those people that love you to death that have the Facebook fan pages for you, bring them into place and have them mm -hmm. manage and be key, key holders. But when you're building these DAOs and you're trying to get, I guess, creators and more, uh, more of the normie crowd in, into play, how do they communicate this to their fans? Like, how do they tell them, guys, you're managing me now. You're managing my brand. You guys, because you helped me build it, like, how, how do they communicate that? Because in crypto, it makes sense, right? It's yeah. like, okay, we apply the ownership economy thesis, et cetera, et cetera. But for creators, more normie people, they have a hard time understanding what Bitcoin is, you know, yeah. like how do you how do you position that uh, in the right way? I think it's the framing that we're all doing this together. You know, I think for a lot of creators, there's historically been a very one sided relationship where a fan is consuming content that you put out and um, they're getting to enjoy that content. But beyond that, they're not really seeing any of the upside associated with it. So the more that you can show and not tell where it's less about we're all in this together and more about actually showing them if you get let's say $100 in from the sale of a t-shirt and you end up giving that back out to fans in the form of a token, 
you know, there are things you can do with your tokens and with your ecosystem to very clearly show that this is a community owned project now. You know, everything that I do is going to be directly valuable to you as well. And over time, you know, it's my hope that we just open that more and more to five years from now when I'm getting every dollar in as an artist, it's going into a community treasury. It's very clearly allocated who it's going to. And as that, we can all kind of win together rather than the world today where you have fans, they're consuming everything. But if they want to get involved on like more of a financial or social level, basically the most that they can do is just share your song a bunch of times on Spotify or Discord or Twitter or Instagram or something and hope that you give it a retweet, which in my opinion falls very short of what's possible. Yeah, no, I a hundred percent. And I think we're seeing very early stages of that. First person that comes to mind uh, is Harrison first. He took mm -hmm. himself public, created his own social token and he incentivized people to earn uh, for by, by basically saying, uh, I need you guys to scout how many times I said this word in the song. And if you guess the right number and DM me, I'll send you tokens. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of it's contributing based off participation. It's contributing based off action. Another cool example that comes to mind is Ali, uh, mm -hmm. who is like a main mainstream Twitch streamer, right? Uh, YouTube personality. And she incentivizes participation by by putting together these huge events, these these gaming events where are solely attainable and accessible through Ali coin. Rewards are distributed through Ali coin to, to buy your way into the event. You got to buy with Ali coin. Right. And now she's like building an ecosystem around Ali Coin, and it's gotten to the point where, and I'm only giving this as an example because it references a lot of what you preached earlier. Now people have become so ingrained and in tune with what Ali Coin can do. Now they're motivated to start building and using it to their advantage. For example, mm -hmm. someone in her DAO is now building a bot, right? Or built a bot that would help streamline communication and processes in the Discord, and they got paid in Ali Coin. Right. Absolutely. And you're, you're seeing like that early formation, but I still think there's still like a mountain to climb with getting people in tune with that process. When it, when it comes to practice, right. What does that funnel look like? What have you seen work? For example, people need to start changing the way they communicate their value add and their value proposition to their fans. And they need to design their funnels for onboarding them to adopt their cryptocurrency, their X token. Mm -hmm. Are there any examples you can kind of give, that have uh, that our people are, are doing it right at least right whether it be guys i'm having this concert if you're able to get if you buy x amount of tokens you'll be integrated blah blah you know what i mean like what does that yeah. funnel look like yeah i mean i think we're seeing a common trend that um people that stream content in some way shape or form if it's on twitch if it's a vlog on youtube if it's on TikTok, you know having a high level funnel to make people aware of what's going on and making a clear call to action to go one level deeper by joining something like a discord i think that's step number one you know, I love that you used Ali as an example. I think that she's a premier creator on Rally that's doing this extremely well. And what I'll call out there is that for the first two months of Ali Coin being in existence, it was very much educational, just saying, guys, I have this token now. I'm super new to it. You know, you can buy some if you want. We're figuring out what to do with it, slowly adding in new access levels. And then over time, you get into a flow, whereas other people in your community become more educated. They can do that for you. You know, there's nothing that uh, I think is worse for a creator to do than go out and just start blanket shilling their token saying, buy this, buy this, buy this, but not supporting the reasons why you need to get involved in the first place. And so I encourage creators to really work on what does access in your community look like? You know, what are the relationships that people can build with you and one another by getting involved? And the more concretely you lay those out, I think the more confident you're going to be in talking about it and the more success you're going to see as a result of that. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I think starting off very small, being honest and transparent that you're new to this and aligning your like insecurities and being empathetic like that to your audience will make it more relatable and more more promising that and more exciting essentially um mm. so when when people are kind of launching these tokens and they transitioning in, into building a DAO, i think many people get excited by the numbers of seeing a name being publicly traded on a screen and it having a certain amount of liquidity and a fully diluted market cap and all these big shiny things attract the people right but now Doing it in practice is what kind of gets it going. And I think many people kind of not, not forget, but maybe don't even understand what challenges kind of face them. So when you're starting yeah. to put build these communities and you're in either you're bootstrapping from nothing or you're trying to onboard an existing fan base or audience and make them more crypto native, um, what, what does that look like in terms of challenges that people aren't seeing? Yeah, so I sent you a message in the chat there. I wrote a blog post for Forefront on how to launch a token. This is basically, you know, the past two years of my life, 
drastically oversimplified into a five-step process on how to launch a token. I think the things that people um, often overestimate is how easy it is to get people to join. Like people buying your token is a pretty hard step. And for you to think that people are just going to do it naturally is pretty naive. And so instead, I think it's about how you give people more ownership and power on like a social basis to feel like they have a part of this project. So that once they're involved as like a moderator or someone active in the community, you giving them tokens doesn't feel like that heavy of a step because they're already actively engaged. If you just try and go out and blindly toss these tokens on people, they're not really going to know what's happening. They're not going to know what's going on. But if you build a deep relationship with your top fans, I think they're much more susceptible to getting involved. And that's why I always tell you know creators to really focus on that top one to 5% of your super fans and try and really educate them because they'll end up doing the legwork for the 95% of the other fans that you have. And your most important goal is just kind of seeding that message outwards so you don't have to keep doing it yourself. So yeah. um, I don't know if you want to take a second to pull this blog post up. I'd love to just like highlight very quickly something Let's that I'm excited it. about. Let's do it. Let me let me share my screen. And as I bring it up, uh, the most common or the most uh, the most relevant example that comes to mind is, again, with Ali and her having such a broad communities, everyone that enters the discord now like she doesn't really have to do anything. Like the community is like, oh, welcome. We're so excited to have you. Here's the steps on how to join. This is how you get started. This is how you buy the coin. And the community is now educating one another. And she's slowly starting to see herself kind of like migrate out of that initial leadership controller position. Uh, but let's, let's, let's bring up this blog post. All right. Super simple to the point. Go. Yeah. So step one, having a community hub. You know, we talked a lot on this call about Discord, something as simple as having a place for all of your fans to come and hang out. Once you've built that out a little bit um, structurally, that you have different channels and whatnot, start taking note of who's contributing to that. So your moderators, the people that are policing the channels, the people who are going out and sharing your streams, you know, keep start keeping track of your super fans that are adding value and then find a partner to help kind of empower them. So issuance partners here, these are platforms like Rally or Coinvise. If you're not a technical person, which Pretty much everyone listening to this, including myself, is not. There are tools on the table now to help you make a token in a very easy way and give you a template to get started. You know, once you have a token out there, there's a bunch of tools at your disposal to kind of upgrade and integrate that stack. So things like Gnosis Safe for, for uh, custody, things like governance, tools like Bonfire on Rally that I mentioned for token distribution type thing. And once you have that blueprint in place, there's a reason why I did step five is token distribution instead of step one. You know, I think it's really important for you to think very hard about what this looks like when you roll it out into the wild. And once you have all these first four steps launched with a token that exists, with people you want to give it to, and with tools to empower the way you use it, then you go out and do a token distribution and kind of kickstart this flywheel. And I think you'll find people will be really excited to get involved because they notice that you put so much time and effort into getting that started in the first place. I think it's a great tool set. Uh, and, and it's coming, obviously, from your point of view. You've got a lot of experience. So anybody that's watching... The video take notes anybody that's streaming this through audio come and watch the video and, and look at this chart i'll also put it in the show notes um so back to these challenges for a minute okay uh, i think like we agreed that the best way to get people on board and uh, from your audience is just to give the token away and a lot of creators might not come from the crypto background nor the financial background to even understand like the levels of giving to holding right so how do you kind of mitigate the the situation where creators just they're like just take my token just take my token they just start airdropping mm -hmm. a bunch of tokens they only have so much liquidity in in their pools and all these fans just don't swap out and like bank run <laughs> the community yeah. right it's a very plausible scenario how totally do they kind of, how do they kind of mitigate that 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 death experience <laughs> Yeah, I think that it's uh, very gradually over time. You know, I think at inception, being really free about who you're giving tokens to is probably okay. It's earlier in the life cycle. Typically, the token is worth less and the marketing exposure of it is more important than kind of the ongoing accumulation. So step one, I think you're looking for awareness, giving people tokens for something as simple as giving you bits on a Twitch stream, giving you a subscription, joining the Discord, you know, things that are really, really obvious in nature, empowering those with really small incentives to kind of start that process. I think that that's V1. And then I think over time, you know, you want to be a lot more calculated about how those tokens go out. So building deeper relationships with people, giving them deeper tasks to work on. I would say the higher quality the project becomes and the more impactful it is, the more tokens that deserve to be earned as an incentive. And what you'll see will happen is instead of you going really broad with giving a thousand people one token each, you're going to start giving one person a thousand tokens. And the more ownership that they have over that project, the more trustworthy you can be with them 
about knowing that they're going to execute on the goals that you're putting in place and the more valuable the stuff that they're producing for you is going to become. Yeah. Let's, let's try to think a few years from now and kind of like speculate on what this future may look like. When do you think we're going to start seeing like Migos do a DAO, right? Or mm -hmm. uh, Justin Bieber do a DAO or uh, Taylor Swift do a DAO. All these community rich individuals who have brands that carry so much weight. When are they going to start decentralizing their communities, do you think? What, what, where's your head at with that? Sooner than you think would be my gut reaction. I'd uh, caveat by saying, when do you think they're going to do it well? I think that that, yeah. uh, that question is much different, which will take three to five years. You know, what I expect is we're going to see a similar wave to NFTs where every creator in the world knows that launching a token has value. We're going to see some sort of nifty gateway like solution. We're launching it as, as easy as possible and people are going to fuck it up. You know, we're going to see huge creators come into the space, launch a token, not really know how to engage with it. Um, over time, a lot of those creators get weeded out. And what will remain will be these creators that have really active Discord servers. They have really strong relationships with their true fans. And they're not just in it to kind of make a statement. Like, they genuinely want this to be a part of their project. And so five years from now, like I said earlier, we're going to see these community tokens represent true ownership in a project where it's basically equity in an artist. So if I discover someone early on, there's a vehicle for me to get involved. There's upside to be gained from it. And I think that once we have the platforms and tools in place for that to happen in a really native way, that's when crypto is mainstream. And it's no longer a question of when it's going to happen. It's something that everyone knows about and is using every single day. Yeah, but there's, there's a problem with that, right? Because a lot of these mainstream uh, celebrities, internet personalities, you know, they've built their fame off people fangirling over them, right? And they have a lot of clout. And at least I haven't seen a lot of these like mainstream individuals kind of come back to these lower level guys, interact with them, hang out with them, build relationships with them. It's really more like you have your Instagram following, you have your Twitter following. Occasionally you go on live shows and you do tours. You can do like backstage fan meet and greets. Like it's it's very disconnected, right? Between the fans, mm -hmm. I feel like, and the, and the artist itself. Would you agree? Like as I'm building this point, would you agree or would you disagree with that? I totally agree with it. I would say that um, I'm really loving the shift to new like subscriber based models. Yeah. So things like OnlyFans, I think are a perfect example of this, where creators are starting to realize that getting buy-ins from their top 1% is exponentially more valuable than getting a like from all their followers. And so we'll slowly start seeing this congregation where every creator is focusing on that core group of fans and they're going to recognize that the value to be created from engaging and capitalizing with them is far more powerful than just having 10 million Instagram followers, let's call it. Yeah. I, I think that's going to be one of the biggest hurdles, kind of like detaching that that barrier, right? And removing that and making the one that they love and adore and, and kind of see big stars over, making them more human, more, more level-headed, you know, so that they can onboard them and make these fan clubs. Like you have Queen, right? Although they haven't mm -hmm. really integrated with their fans, but like the Queen community... There's the movie. There's like these the people dress up as queen characters. You know, they hang out at bars together. It's basically a, a DAO to an extent without the band yep. kind of managing everything. And it lives and outlives itself. Right. And yeah. I, I, I think that that's kind of like the goal that everybody should be playing towards, should be building towards. Uh, and DAOs now provide that instrument to do so. Right. Yeah, and I think the okay. difference is that uh, there's now an incentive for an artist to do that. You know, historically, there's transitive benefits where if you build a super fan community, hopefully they're going to buy more tickets. But with these tokens, it's so direct now, and you can see that value being capitalized in real time, that I think it's going to be much more obvious why you need to do this. And you're going to see those benefits right away, as opposed to historically, if you grow a big fan community, there's a lot of social capital to be gained from it. It's the right thing to do, but that only translates to really merch sales and ticket sales versus now where it's $10 investment in your token and you now have 100,000 people around the world holding it and you have a million dollar small business com company just to be able to run and do cool stuff with. I love it, man. Coop, you're, you're a wealth of information. Thanks for being on. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you always. Uh, where can people kind of hear from you, find you? Give yourself a quick shout out. Best place to follow me on socials is at Koopa Troopa. I'm most active on Twitter. It's where I spend the most of my time online. If you're looking to go level deeper than this and you stay to listen this long, shoot me a message on Discord at Koopa Troopa number 9799. Would love to hear what you're working on and help point you in the right direction for some next steps. Amazing, dude. Thank you. Thank you for having me on, man. We'll talk soon.